I V M. Official legend or the official narrative goes that in the lifetime of the Prophet himself, the first mosque was constructed in Kerala. So the Prophet dies in 632 CE, I think, and this was built around 629 CE. Obviously, the current structure is not that old, so there's no way to scientifically date it. But you know, you you, you find other clues in history, which is that whether it happened in 629 or not. By 849, just two centuries later, you find Arabic signatories on a grant given by a Hindu king to Christians. So a Hindu king is giving a grant to a Christian community and the witnesses are Muslims. Hello and welcome to the Filter Coffee Podcast. Kerala is my most favorite place in India if not the entire world. Besides the fact that I have way too many close friends from there, I've always been in love with its topography, food, politics, weather, its cinema, and most importantly, its culture. A culture that is not a one-off thing, but something that seeps into everything that I just mentioned. And it is a culture that is also very unique, unlike anything you will find even in the rest of India. It is also unique in its approach to nature, women, families, and most importantly, society in itself. I often wondered where it originated. In Manu Pillai's book, The Ivory Throne, originally published in 2016 by HarperCollins, I think I found most of my answers. The core of the book is the great succession battle between the two queens, uh, who are also sisters. But the book is also an extraordinary history of Kerala itself, a place where women enjoyed freedom that was until then unprecedented and since then unduplicated anywhere in the world. A place where Christianity took root even before it entered Europe and a place where Islam came for trade and stayed for love. Manu's book was also in the news recently because of the verdict around the Padmanabha Swami temple where the Supreme Court overruled an earlier Kerala High Court verdict and gave control of the temple and its treasures back to the royal family of Travancore last week. But it was also an extraordinary phenomenon that happened to the Indian literary and history worlds recently. The ivory throne rose to great popularity, not just for the untold story, but also for the way it was told, a popular narrative without compromising on factual accuracy. Manu will go on to write three books before he turned 30 and I'm told he's presently working on his fifth. I want to speak to Manu about the Supreme Court verdict, its implications on what remains of the royal family today, his book, his research methods. But most importantly, I wanted to speak to Manu about brand Kerala and its core DNA. Welcome to the Filter Coffee Podcast, Manu. Before we go into you know your book and... Uh the land of Kerala, so to say. I wanted to first uh, sort of start with uh, the verdict itself. Right? I mean, for, for, for the uninitiated, this is the Padmanabha Swami temple, uh, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's, it's an 18, it's an 8th century sort of temple built by Maharaja Martanda Varma. Is, is that correct? Well, the temple goes back at least over a thousand years. The current uh, form and structure that you see was built by Martanda Varma in the 18th century. So the, the earliest structure was a very different one. The current structure you see in Trivandrum was an 18th century one. So, so all the, 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 the 365 pillars for... One all 18th century. century. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, okay. in fact, the, the temple used to be a much simpler place before that. It had, it had a thatched roof. So you can imagine. Right. And it didn't have that gopuram. You know, none of those things were there. The, the, that carved corridor, none of that was there. It right. was a much simpler shrine, but mm-hmm. it appears in very old poetry. There are records of its existence. So mm-hmm. yeah, it does go back at least over a thousand years, but mm-hmm. the physical structure is not that old. Uh, but but the uh, the eighteen feet Vishnu in a reclining position that has that has always been the same. 
No. So even the the chief image or the chief idol inside, there used to be a wooden one originally. Again, it signals in some way the somewhat more modest situation of the temple originally. But then in Martanda Orma's time, he's the one who, as part of his overall sort of grandification of the temple, decided to replace the wooden image with a, a salagrama. Image. So, so it's 12,008 salagramas, which have been imported from Nepal by the king. And he then sort of unites them. There's this thing called Kattasharikara Yoga, which is a special mix that sort of holds this all together in, uh, like a cement. Mm. And uh, there are 12,008 round salagrama stones in it, through which this huge image of the deity has been constructed. Understood. And, and for the uninitiated, the salagrama stone is a special kind of stone which is uh, auspicious for Vishnu and, and Vaishnava, uh, Vaishnavite temples. Like yeah, even even a single one, you know, has is considered to be sacred. So you right. often find that people have, you know, they may not have twelve thousand salagramas, but yeah, yeah. you do be, find people who worship even individual uh, stones. That's no, so true. I actually grew up in a household like me. Uh, uh, I I didn't know about its significance much later, but uh, in the puja room that we had through my grandmother, or probably even earlier, we had this one stone. It's always called saligram. Right? Yeah. Um, so. Fascinating, uh, and 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 the temple is in news because of you know I think I think in 2017 the Supreme Court appointed a panel under Gopal Subramaniam to assess the the value of the vault, which I guess you know it was probably opened after 130 years or something. And well, there are all these these figures, but in reality, right. the the record suggests that you know these years that are bandied about don't really add up to what is available on the record. So, for example, you find that in the 1930s, uh, there are there are not only media reports but also a contemporary travel uh, book refers to the fact that you know there were there was a time in the early 30s when the temple was opened. Then there was a time when the temple actually had a fire. So when the fire took place around in the same decade, so when that happened, again, I imagine some of the things were removed and sort of taken away for safekeeping. And then they must have been restored to the temple afterwards. And uh, in, I mean, the, even the, the, the controversial B color, B color is the vault right directly under the shrine. Hmm. Even that one, you know, there is this uh, fear that if you open it, some kind of calamity and cataclysmic event will happen. But uh, Vinodrai's report, Vinodrai was uh, appointed by the court to look into the accounts and so on. Mm. He saw that in the records of the temple alone, it's been opened, what, seven times in the last 20, 30 years. So oh, wow. again, you know, there is this, the media sort of plays up this mystique of the temple. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. a, you know, there's a whole hoo-ha that's made around it. But in reality, it was, you know, it was not completely unknown to people. People knew there was a lot of treasure inside. It's just that nobody had sat and counted it. So the committee, etc. happened after the case began to get serious. So there was a case originally in the late 2000s. Then 2011 or so, the, the ruling family, the Maharaja's family lost that particular case in the Kerala High Court. And then they went to the Supreme Court. That's right. when the Supreme Court brings in Gopal Subramaniam and appoints this committee. And there's this inventory taking of, of all the contents of the vault and so on. Mm. You know, with so much fact and fiction going around, uh, I think one account that I read was, uh, you know, over 100,000 crores. Right? Is, is, that, mm. is there any, any credibility to that or... I mean, I mean there, some of these figures were put out, you know, pretty early on, I think, by certain members of the committee speaking either openly or anonymously to the press. That's what I heard. So, yeah, you know, you have yeah. a few, uh, I think in the early phase, in the first year or so, there were committee members who were talking to the press. So that's when the press initially got some inkling of what was in the vault. These amounts, I have, I don't know how they've been calculated because you see the value of the material is not merely in the weight or in the, in the gold itself. Because a lot of this is very old stuff. So when you when you're dealing with gold that's say 700 years old, the way you value it is very different. It's not exactly. the kind of present day gold that you can melt down and value. It's not a block of gold. We are talking about centuries old artifacts. So the the method of valuing those artifacts is extremely uh, complicated and it's very different. So I don't know if the the hundred thousand crores and or 22 billion dollars and all these numbers that we saw in the press, whether yeah. they are some sort of calculation based purely on the weight of the gold and, you know, contemporary prices of the gold or whether they actually do factor in the antique value of these of these uh, goods as well. But right. either way, I mean, the point I think these figures are trying to make is that it's an enormous uh, giant hoard that's sitting inside the temple. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think um, some of these also date back to Napoleonic era sort of uh, uh, gold artifacts. 
Yeah, right. that is the more recent uh, right. goal because you have, you know, early 19th century, you do also have a record of a king personally sort of donating 100,000 coins, uh, gold coins at the time. And, you know, there's a record in an 1860s book which says that he was so devout that he actually sat there for a whole hour and personally sort of, you know, transferred it from one container to the other, the you know, his container into the temple's container. So, you know, you have that. And therefore, the early 19th century Napoleonic era sort of gold and, and coins, etc. do make sense. But what is more interesting is there are also, I believe, coins with Arabic inscriptions on them. And there are coins that go back to a much, much earlier period. And I think that, I mean, it's in a temple and it belongs to the temple. But there's also, if, you know, a, a, a committee of experts could get their hands on it, there's also a lot of history waiting to be uncovered through mm-hmm. this material evidence. Because that gold, if it goes back all these centuries, goes back, some of it apparently is as old as 900, 1000 years. So if it's that old, then, you know, it would be interesting to see, to study it in an academic sense and try and mm-hmm. find out. Uh, where it may have come from and you can sort of have there are all these dating methods and so on but I doubt that's going to happen anytime soon people's sensitivities are ultra <laughs> you know uh, okay. soft at the moment they're not going to allow any outsiders to come in and do any kind of uh, scientific study on this on, on on the gold and treasure that's in the temple so I right. think that's a very far away moment before we have a historical analysis yeah yeah. No, I mean it, it, talking of historical analysis the part in all of this that really uh, struck me is actually the the relationship between uh, the royal family and the temple itself, right? In fact, uh, if you go to the the, the legal, uh, I, I think the the royal families have rights which are known as Shebaite rights. I don't know if I'm yeah, pronouncing it, it derives right. from Sevayat. Seva as in you know to serve. Ah, okay. And that's been. <laughs> I think that's what got anglicized into Shebaite ship. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, and when I was looking it up, you know, in a, in a legal journal, uh, there was a lot of uh, description on what it means, etc. I found this one sentence really interesting, which is it says, um, these rights mean, you know, the custodian of the deity and its earthly spokesman mm. uh, or spokesperson, which, which it seemed like, uh, like a very galactic sort of definition for the for the word itself. <laughs> uh, but, but what is this? And, and this temple sort of... Uh, uh, makes its way, uh, you know, into your book and the associated story of the royal family in many different ways. What is the kind of relationship that uh, the royal family had with this temple? Well, there are, you know, two ways to look at it from their own internal sort of family tradition. It is that, you know, there was this 18th century king called Martanda Varma. He's the one who, of course, as I said earlier, beautifies the temple and constructs much of what you see today, including the present day idol. All of that was his doing. So their narrative has him one day, you know, surrendering all his all his earthly possessions to the deity and saying that, look, uh, hereafter, all of this and me as well, like he, the ruler included, everything belongs to the deity. And I'm merely the deity's dasa. Uh, the deity's servant doesn't quite uh, capture the full meaning of the word dasa. I mean, slave is not appropriate either. But, you know, it's something like that. I, I'm basically the deity's uh, dasa here. I'm going to rule the kingdom on behalf of the deity. So the deity becomes the owner of the state, the, you know, everything for the state and the family and the family ever since rules in the name of the deity. So for example, when a, a baby is born in the family, girl or boy, the parent has to take the day, the, the child to the temple after a certain number of days. And there, there is a specific mandapa on which only the members of the of the family are allowed. Hmm. And they, they lay the deity on that. And the custom, I believe, is that the, the, the mother has to walk away without looking back for a certain, you know, a period of time. So the deity is considered, the child is hereafter considered as belonging to the deity. So the mother has handed over all her rights over the child to the deity. But of course, then the mother comes back and raises the child. But that's a very, you know, basic ceremony that's done when a member of the family is an infant. As as young as a child, that's when they do these initial ceremonies. Hmm. And each time they, they get older and somebody succeeds to the title of Maharaja and then the other one is heir apparent or L.A. Raja. And hmm. on the female side, the senior Rani and the junior Rani, these four main titles, they have to do this special ritual called um, uh, Padi Etam. Padi means steps. Hmm. Ketam or Etam is to climb. So they're right. on the mandapam. There are these beautiful steps. And there's a ceremonious ritual way of sort of getting onto the mandapam, which is how they take their official positions in the family 
on behalf of the deity. So, you know, for them, in many ways, if you speak to a lot of the members now, they see it very much as a spiritual connection. They see it very much as their family's ancestral right to serve the deity, things like that. But of course, you know, when you're talking about kings and queens and politics, it's not just uh, the official narrative and it's not just spiritual. One of the reasons Martanda Varma sort of surrendered his kingdom to the deity was partly because he, you know, he had conquered a lot of territories where he was seen as an outsider. He was seen as an invader. People did not treat him with any kind of legitimacy. He was seen as a foreigner. So right. one way of getting rid of that stigma. And, you know, he also had to upgrade himself in caste. His, his origins were rather modest. You know, there was mm-hmm. nothing grand about where he came from. So to right. sort of paper over all of that modest origin, to paper over the violence, to paper over the fact that he was seen as an illegitimate ruler in many places, he had to sort of go beyond that and create a new narrative. So surrendering the, de- the, de- the territories to the deity, surrendering his kingdom and possessions to the deity, became a means to sort of bypass all this criticism. By doing that, suddenly, you know, the, the uh, criticizing the king was no longer acceptable. It was considered equivalent to sort of blaspheming the deity. Anything you said against the state was considered Swami Droha. Swami meaning mm. Pappanara Swami. Droham mm. meaning to betray or to go against, to defy. So the idea was that now you can't really question the king or the royal family because everything now is done in the name of God. And there is this, you know, inside joke that a member of the family told me once in, in confidence, and I won't name them for that reason. But mm-hmm. they did joke once that even within the family, there was this, this little, you know, mischievous telling that because Padmanabha Swami is in yoga nidra with eyes half closed, the king could get away with doing whatever he liked without the deity realizing what he was doing. So, you know, they, even the, there were members in the family as well who realized, you know, that this was, partly also a strategic move. This was also, I mean, think of it in, in terms of politics today, where you find, you know, this whole, if, you, if you're against the government, you'll be called an anti-national. If you're yeah, yeah. too leftist, then, you know, then also you're an anti-national. So there is this whole nationalism, anti-nationalism. Debate. You're probably even anti-Hindu. Right. Yeah, you you get branded all these yeah. things, right? And it's it's pretty much. I mean, it's not the exact same thing. The contexts are different, but the, that impulse is the same, which is that you're trying to completely avoid criticism by uh, t- turning the narrative to something that suits you. Right. So to to criticize, and the kings were not considered divine figures before this. The king, you know, Martha and Orma himself, before his succession, spent years, according to his own legends, he spent years wandering from place to place because the nobility did not like him and they were constantly trying to assassinate him. So royal blood was not sacred. But as soon as you become Padmanabha Swami's dasa, now your blood is sacred because now, oh my God, you know, anybody doing any harm to you means it's equivalent to doing some kind of injustice to the deity and no good Hindu, which meant in those days, the aristocracy, the Brahmins, you know, landowners, none of them would oppose the king hereafter. Yeah. And what is revealing is that even as late as the 1810, so this happens around 1750, the, the sort of surrendering to the deity and the enshrining of Padmanabha Swami as the owner of Travancore. But even about, uh, you know, 60, 70 years later, you have the rulers of Travancore who are still hesitant to even visit northern districts of their own kingdom because they feel that, you know, people over there uh, still don't see them as legitimate or still entertain some kind of hostility to them. So even though there was this narrative uh, Philip that was given in their favor, in reality, people never forgot that this was uh, not entirely a peaceful sort of creation, that the story of giving everything away to God sort of Mm -hmm. conceals a lot of complicated history and politics behind it. Right. And then, you know, in, in sticking with the political analogy, this whole association with this temple seems to have been a uh, a master stroke, right? And because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you know, in, in the preface to the to the book, The Ivory Throne, you also write that uh, Travancore itself was not a very consequential part of uh, the history of Kerala up until him, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, the Zamorins uh, and then uh, some of the other large rulers really played a huge role uh, up until very recently. And uh, Martin Darma seems to have uh, really had a very steep career graph, you know, in terms yes. of coming into prominence uh, and then breaking out as one of the most important figures in, in the history of Kerala, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, he was, uh, a, what was interesting is that he was a rule breaker. So, you know, there was, firstly, he ruled over this complete like tip of Kerala, which is really the Kanyakumari district. It's not even in Kerala anymore. So the, the great irony is that this, you know, what people think of as the royal family of Kerala, the original capital 
city and their biggest sort of old fashioned you know wooden construction palace that entire palace complex it sits in tamil nadu today it's not really in kerala and the the historian slash statesman k m paniker in the in the 20th century wrote once you know rather uh, you know bitterly about how travancore was essentially a tamilian conception and its its victory over all these kingdoms in kerala was the victory of tamilian culture over malayali culture because there was something called kerala maryada maryada basically means custom or usage you know conventions and the mm. convention was that and partly because of geography because kerala had for has 44 rivers criss crossing it so you know in in those days it was not easy to communicate to keep some kind of centralized hold over all of these regions so what kings often did is if they defeated another enemy king they would merely make that person his their vassal and so long as the person sent a flag and a little bit of tribute and sort of recognized the suzerainty of the other victorious king it did not matter nobody actually annexed territory and kings were not the major kings were not dependent for revenue on land they used to get the the bulk of their revenue from trade because kerala is a trading society so you know you, they made huge amounts from from their trade with europe from their trade with the arabs from their trade with the ottoman empire you know this huge arabian sea ecosystem so they were not dependent on land so owning controlling land by itself was never a preoccupation before martha mm-hmm. what he does is he comes as i said from a corner that's not really at all an important uh, space in the trading world and mm-hmm. he realizes that the world has started to change so the colonial companies have come and they've disrupted and changed the rules of trade the old kings like the zamorin of calicut are on the decline they no longer have the power they once possessed so you know the old system is starting to collapse and decay so clearly he's sensing that there's some kind of a vacuum here that's building and he can exploit that for his uh purposes so the first thing he does is he of course gets rid of all his own noble families you know about 40 odd odd families he sort of uh, gets the men slaughtered and the women are sort of uh, re- diminished in caste and sold to fishermen so that these families can never come back and never perpetuate themselves and he centralizes all their resources all their uh, property and in fact the the story goes that even a lot of their their homes you know their mansions were made of wood right that's how the construction is in much of kerala yeah. so the woodwork you see in a lot of these palaces uh, in travancore apparently comes from the wood that was taken from the houses of these dispossessed and, and sort of destroyed noble families so he gets rid of all the opposition in the temple he gets rid of the temple committee he sort of completely makes them toothless and and makes them subordinate to him so the raja becomes the main person in the padmanabha swami temple as well uh, you remember that trivandrum is not even the capital capital is in kanyakumari then he starts doing this thing where he starts set building a centralized army rather than depending on feudal lords he builds a centralized army he gets uh, these mercenaries from tamil nadu he gets a brahmin general from tamil nadu called ramayan dalava who's mm. who's essentially the amit shah to his narendra modi mm. and together they end up conquering territory and this conquering is extremely unusual defeat kings and you make them vassals that is part of the old system here he actually sends these families they all rush into exile and he annexes their, their territory and you know it doesn't matter who's in his way at one point there's even a brahmin prince that he he say he wants to fight and his own soldiers say no we can't raise our sword against a brahmin it would be some kind of sin to sort of kill to, to shed the blood of a brahmin so what does he do he brings in these muslim and christian soldiers and gets the work done with them he uses english arms gets a dutch prisoner of war to train his troops so sort of modernizes his army in a great way and all of this is extremely new in kerala it is again to to make a, to sort of uh, compare it to something happening in our own time you know what the present prime minister is doing is in many ways he's changing the rules he's changing the way things are done there were there are certain assumptions that this is how things were done here but he's actually pushing those boundaries and he's saying no i'm going to redefine this uh, you know in my own way and you can see a lot of that happening you can see you know things that were considered sacrosanct for example the whole kashmir thing he's decided he found a way to sort of uh, to to break that i mean yeah. i'm not talking about good or bad what i'm saying is that it's a parallel you can find that things nobody expected would happen came to pass yeah. the same yeah. happened then as well so this man then conquers this huge uh, chunk of territory which is precisely why he was seen as illegitimate because he had broken every established rule that existed at the time and you know people were not the elite were not willing to accept that and he had to in, in many parts of of the of his own state he had to fight for years and keep his troops active as though he was in occupied territory because people would not accept him so yeah it is it's a it's a fairly interesting a uh, way to look at it and the irony of course is that mm. he, he after he created the state 
not only did it become ultra brahmanical by the 19th century it was officially defining itself as the hindu state of travancore and i find this whole martanda varma plus his minister slash general ramayan dalwa combination similar right. to narendra modi and amit shah <laughs> where, where, you know ramayan was considered martanda varma's chanakya just as people say amit shah is modi's chanakya mm-hmm. and the idea that you know they they created what would define itself as a hindu state again to me it's a, it's a fascinating parallel with things that are happening in our own time and what is uh, somebody in trivandrum once told me and this was even more uh, amusing in many ways was that martanda varma was called aniram tirunal aniram or anuradha was the star under which he was born mm. and this gentleman i met in trivandrum said do you know narendra modi is also born under aniram and this is Are after the thing i just told you just now i had sort of said this at one of these public events and that afterwards this man came to me and said you forgot one more parallel between them it is that the present prime minister is also an aniram and i was like wow this is <laughs> amusing at any rate even if not right. officially in the realm of history you know uh, uh, just uh, and, and we will come back to you know why this hindu state of travancore obviously uh, is extremely misleading given what kerala was we'll just come to kerala in a bit uh, but just to stick with the with the verdict part of this discussion i'm now skipping this entire book uh, of the ivory throne and then cutting to to today i think the last thread i i read about is that uh, the, the the senior rani moves to bangalore after uh, a, a very tragic uh, turn of events etc and her children sort of lead a normal life in in bangalore etc uh, who survives now you know as the royal family and, and who will be the people who will be controlling the temple from here on so the 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 rule and the supreme court judgment affirms it and it's very clear it is marumakatai marumakatai is the matrilineal system of succession right. now the matrilineal system of succession simplistically put is succession from uncle to nephew which is that when a man dies his own wife and children they're not considered members of the family his sister is considered his you know immediate family member and her children are his heirs as well the idea is you need to be born from the same female line so you, you know, i mean there used to be a saying that you know a king if he relies on his wife to produce his heir he can never be fully certain that the child is his whereas if it's a sister no matter who the father of the child is it's definitely his sister's blood and he and his sister do definitely share the same royal blood so that sort of makes sure that the succession continues in the same family and the bloodline remains pure uh without you know uh, depending on the, on the king's wife who may or may not have produced the king's own child so i mean that is that's just a, a, a later sort of story around it but that sort of explains the basic premise but the succession is quite simple it's done on the basis of seniority now uh, travancore is a pretty small family compared to all the other royal and ex aristocratic families in kerala for example the zamorun and the cochin royal families zamoruns are the, the rulers of calicut and cochin mm-hmm. of course has its own uh, ex royal family uh, both of these have hundreds of members you know 800 odd i think in both these families and they come from uh, in the cochin royal family there are four kovilagams or four palaces uh you know into which uh, these people are branched and in, in calicut it's three branches and it does not matter who the previous zamorun was the next eldest person in all the branches taken together is the next person to inherit the title so seniority is the is the guiding principle so much so that if so even generation does not matter so for example right. if a nephew is born before an uncle because in those days you know having this uh, if a woman gives birth to her first child at 16 and then she has another child at 40 you often find the situation where uncles can be older than their own uh, you know uh, uncles can be younger than their own nephews for example so in a situation like that the nephew gets to rule first before the uncle because seniority is what determines your position in the in the hierarchy so in the travancore family what is interesting is that there were these two maharanis in the in the 20th century they were yeah. sisters of course unfortunately they did not get along with each other there was power sort of vitiated the relationship between them there was this competition to produce the next male heir although it's a matrilineal system it's still the man born to the females who actually gets the title of maharaja when there is no man then the woman can rule as maharaja with the title of maharaja itself but otherwise normally it's the man who rules so the junior although the senior rani was the eldest female in the family which gave her a lot of prominence and the junior rani was technically in her shadow subordinate to her junior rani was favored in another way which is that she got to have the first male child which was the last maharaja of travancore balram varma and then she had one more male child 
who was the man so balram varma was maharaja till 1949 then of course till 1991 he was still alive so that entire period he was the one who was at the helm of the temple when he died his immediate younger brother who was born in 1922 uh he became the head of the family till his own death mm-hmm. in 2013 now these were the only two men of that generation now you have to come to the next generation for the succession now the junior rani had one daughter senior rani had two daughters all three women are equal members of the family their children have equal claims on the uh, succession so what happens is junior rani's daughter has a son and he is the one who is the present head of the family born in 1949 Hmm. and of course junior rani has a daughter, uh, you know uh, two granddaughters as well you know their kids etc they live in trivandrum they live in the big palace in kaudiar a rather impressive structure and they are the ones who uh, are most prominently visible in the media as members of the family but there are only seven members in that branch of the family so it's the current gentleman his two sisters and they've got uh, four children between them those two the two ladies and beyond that they don't actually have children so there's only in the, in the last generation in that branch there's only one woman and she doesn't have children so the line technically ends over there as far as they are concerned hmm. the and they did have an adoption in the 1990s but i don't know what's happened to that because the adoption should not have happened as per the old rules and after that one has not heard of this adopted person so i don't know if that adoption is still considered valid now the senior rani's branch she didn't have sons so in the previous generation of the last raja there were no men but her daughters did have sons so the current gentleman from the kaudiar palace junior rani branch is 1949 born the next four or five members who were born in the 1950s and early 60s they all come from the senior rani's branch of the family mm. so as per the matrilineal system of succession they will soon inherit as soon as you know this gentleman's tenure is over whenever he uh, passes away the next uh, incumbent or the person due to sort of get the title would be from the senior maharani's branch except that because of the feud between the two maharanis it was such a, a sort of uh, complicated feud that right. the senior rani's own palace it was it was a, a smallish palace so the mm. junior rani's palace is a rather grand one over 100 rooms you know physically very imposing the senior rani lived in a much smaller house really i don't think right. it had more than 18 19 rooms so relatively a modest sort of place but even that structure after independence was claimed by the junior rani's son as his property right. so senior rani was left even without her official palace in her own name so she sort of just moved away to 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 bangalore and went into sort of self sort of chosen ex- exile of her own and her children have not lived sort of a royal lifestyle since then so they she sort of encouraged them to sort of have careers to to sort of become members of a democratic society so her daughters were considered themselves very progressive so in 1949 when the eldest daughter moved to bangalore one of the first things she did was to give up her titles so right. where she was uttram tiruna lalitamba bai tambura you know third princess of, second princess of travancore she simply mm-hmm. started calling herself lalita varma and you know that's what she did with her kids as well but i mean none of this actually negates their position as far as the temple is concerned changing names and not using your royal sort of uh, heritage as a calling card that is that may be considered very progressive but in the temple you're still the one who will inherit the title at some point so it will be interesting to see what those dynamics are because the for example the next in line is a retired golf playing businessman who lives in bangalore the person right. after that lives in chennai and he's a novelist called shri kumar varma the third in line after that is is uh, lives in is lives in australia where he's a retired businessman the fourth used to live in philadelphia where he was learning art at a at an atelier and now he's back in bangalore working on his first art exhibition so you know there's a <laughs> mix of people there and the greatest right. you know the the most interesting of course is down the line there's even a surgeon and the the irony is he actually lives in kerala and practices surgery and is a practicing doctor in calicut and you know right. he he lives a regular professional life there and it would be interesting to see when his term comes this yeah. this uh, you know ex surgeon turned padmanabha dasa leading the deity in the temple right you know i find of, of all of this uh, uh, the most fascinating of course is the is the arc of uh, the senior rani and uh, mm-hmm. which and this this senior rani versus junior rani this entire story of how the whole thing pans out is really uh, i think 80% of 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 the ivory throne you know of which we only yeah. spoken about the the preface what i really uh, found fascinating about the senior rani story is um, you know the verdict itself uh, today talks about the you know the accession terms yeah. uh, between the travancore uh, royal family and the nation called india and why you know because of that it cannot be taken in by the state uh, which i guess is is what happened 
uh, in 2011 when when the ruler died uh, yeah. or probably even earlier than that the, the communist government sort of took over the properties uh, but uh, i think the arc of you know you spoke about her daughter sort of moving uh, and then eventually the senior rani herself sort of leaves the palace um, yeah. you know when kerala becomes more of a communist state um, and sort of moves to uh, to her daughter's place there uh and then continues there till till she dies right i found a, a certain tragedy and towards the end of uh, her life she also comes to refer to this phase of her life as as her freedom right? yeah there's uh, a there's a scene where you know so yeah. her ex palace today houses a medical research institute or is an institute of national eminence called the sri chitra institution and you know it's quite funny because during the emergency there was a real fear that because this palace was lying empty and there was a court case going on at that time because as i said the junior rani's son claimed it and he eventually won that case right. but you know they were afraid that they were going to lose uh, that palace so what what happened is marani decided to give it away for a good cause so at that time the head of the sri chitra institute came to her and he got very late getting there so she could sign the papers over to the institute renouncing her claim over the property to the institute and he he told me when i met him that it was the most sort of for him it was an extremely poignant moment because he had come he knew her he had grown up in travanco his family was you know uh, one of these old aristocratic families so he he sort of knew of what she had been she had been a queen in a, in a place with 300 servants limousines state guards you know she had met every everybody from gandhi to edda mussolini you know dealt with crores of rupees in revenue she had actually ruled very much a figure who had impressed you know uh, a large number of people from tagore to mountain batten right. and here she was in bangalore you know bedridden in a in a in a little room in to in the final years of her life and he comes to her and he gets very late because the flights are delayed his bags get lost and so on but when he gets there you know he calls up her house and her daughter says no it's you know it's, she's still awake she's waiting for to do this she doesn't want to sleep before she actually signs the papers and it's nearly midnight by the time he gets there and she actually you know puts pen to paper and apparently she hands over the documents to him she says valetan this is my freedom at midnight and that was you know there's a famous book called freedom at midnight there is of course jawaharlal nehru's yeah. big speech of freedom at midnight in 1947 she was basically playing on that she was sort of letting go of her past saying now handing over the rights of even the palace from which she ruled the palace from where where she had once lived as a queen to even hand over that was her totally accepting and radically transforming who she was she was sort of giving up an entire uh, piece of her own personality and she was about to die in complete obscurity there is a, a highly tragic quality yeah. to that in yeah. fact yeah. and it sort of reminds me of, uh, of uh, i don't know if you ever felt this way it sort of reminds me of uh, of pu yi who was you know the mm, last, the last uh, emperor yeah. of uh, yeah. china who also sort of just like the senior rani sort of takes the throne when he is literally an infant yeah um, and then uh, you know when the communist take over china he sort of moves out yeah and um, and eventually there's also a, a, a wonderful film made on his life um, he was in fact at one point a gardener or something in beijing and yeah. there's this interesting moment in his life where he visits the old palace in which he lived you know the yes. the, the forbidden city and all of that and, and he's not allowed to go to his throne right So he's not and no but when he's inside he he's very excited and he's telling people that I used to you know I used to live here this used to be yeah. my home I yeah. used to be master of all this and people are just sort of looking at him wondering who this sort of crazy figure is but <laughs> it's it's tragic there is a you know it is. and to be fair this whole royal enterprise was feudalistic there was a caste uh, you know discriminatory angle to it all that is true but if you look at it purely as a, a human story you know this person mm-hmm. this woman from the age of 5 she's surrounded by these hundreds of servants nobody calls her by name you know she's a highness to everybody and then suddenly to be stripped of all that and more importantly accepting it i think for me what the story really spoke was we live in a time where even today there are these successions and coronations and if you go to rajputana every second person you you throw a stone you hit a prince it's one of those yeah. situations in rajputana where everyone's very proud of their royal lineage or whatever and this is people in the 21st century who have no actual experience of living in the pre british era whereas this was a woman who actually ruled she had actually been sort of sovereign in that state you know as i said crores of rupees in revenue in those days you know one of the top 10 states in india one of the figures of the day she was a major character in the 19 20s and 30s 
and to willingly sort of let that go and to accept it. I think there was a there was some kind of you know I don't know confidence or grace or something, and the words are not sufficient to sort of explain yeah. it yeah. fully. But there was something that made her special in her in her capacity to cut off and say, "Well, that was that. I am no longer." that person and you for me when i was doing my research i remember coming across an envelope in which a letter had been received the letter of course i was looking for the letter but even the envelope spoke to me in a very interesting way because it was her husband or something or someone who had written to her and uh, he had addressed the envelope simply as shrimati se to lakshmi bai and i asked her granddaughter and she said yeah after she moved to bangalore she preferred being called shrimati se to lakshmi bai later in some court judgments and cases as well she she signs and writes her name simply as shrimati se to lakshmi bai ex regent of travancore she doesn't use much of her royal background and this was a woman whose full name till 1949 was her highness shri padmanabha sevini vanchi dharmavarthini rajarajeshwari maharani puralam tirunal se to lakshmi bai maharaja artingal muta dambara and companion of the order of the crown of india i mean that was her full sort of title and she had these academic degrees also to go with it and to then willingly by the 1950s when you're in your 60s you know so late in life to give up everything that was familiar to you from the age of 5 to give up everything that you knew as part of your personality and to become a new person called shrimati setu lakshmi bai i think there was yeah there is something there in that story <laughs> you know um, uh, before we go on a break and, and when we come back i want to speak to you about brand kerala itself right mm. but but just on the book you know uh, in the introduction when i was telling you that usually you know history is written like we say by by the victors of wars etc and uh, very rarely is it corrected from the point of view of uh, some of the underdogs so to say right mm. uh, in, in in many ways uh, the the story of the senior rani was not the the victor story right you can argue no. that it is an underdog story but uh, the story of travancore itself is, is is not necessarily the the most told story right and and thanks to you mm. now it has become a phenomenon and right? the book has become a phenomenon <laughs> uh, and the story is associated with it has become a phenomenon at what point manu um, did you want to choose this as a topic of your first book i mean but at what point did it actually start to happen so you know you uh, refer to how history is you know written by the victors right and the right. the greatest victors of history are of men there aren't enough right. people talking about women to begin with not because the women are absent but because nobody is bothered to become a storyteller for many of these women who do exist in history for me it was very stark how in kerala there's such a sort of propaganda machine i would say around the last maharaja he's considered pratyaksha padmanabha you know a god on earth the this extremely pious figure so saintly people are so devoted to him all of that and then to read records where you find that you know he he wouldn't Uh, give for example his he would he insisted that his aunt's palace the senior rani's palace was his own palace he found you know he when the integration of the state was taking place with the indian union indian union government of india officials were surprised to find that he never even mentioned the senior rani he's talking about allowances for his family his mother his sister the letter actually says he not once referred to the existence of the senior rani so extreme pettiness also appears in this man and for me that was extremely interesting to find out you know what is it that we have a officially constructed external image but then there's also often in every famous individual there is this deeply insecure resentful sort of character as well there are two sides mm-hmm. to any person but the story itself came to me uh, in the course in my teens you know i didn't grow up in kerala my family is from kerala but when we go there i would hear a lot of stories about my own family you know the local culture all of that that as the years passed in, you know and as i started getting older i started looking at the region's history which led me to the concept of travancore because where we come from it was one of these regions that was defeated by martandavarma in the 18th century and in our place you know there was always this sort of uh, contempt uh, very subdued not openly but within uh, these old families they would often have a little bit of contempt for the travancore kings saying that no no our original king was a kayangulam raja not this travancore royal family and i found that very interesting so i started you know reading up more on travancore and how it was created and things like that which of course then led me to a whole paper trail of official publications and you know wonderful every king is this amazing person and then you reach the setu lakshmi bai story and she's often covered quickly in about two pages and, you know nobody wants to talk in any great detail about her mm-hmm. and i kept wondering why is it that where you have these great homilies and encomiums loaded on all these other rulers with her there is this anxiety to move over quickly to move to the next ruler which was the last maharaja and pretend as though hers was just a brief thing that didn't really make much of a difference right. and when i started asking questions to some 
elders in my own family. I remember my great uncle who who's about 100 years old now. He's the one who first told me that ah, if you go down that route, you know, you're going to find a lot of skeletons in this royal closet. And I thought, well, you know, I was about 18 years old at the time. And when you're 18 years old and you're told not to do something, your tendency is to do the exact opposite. So I started digging around. And, you know, that then led me to to uh, uncovering a lot of this story. And, you know, the archives in Delhi, Kerala and London together pieced her life. And I realized that, hold on, behind all this PR about this pious royal family and their, and their simplicity and all of that, there is... Uh, a dramatic, almost petty sort of reality. And it, it was interesting for me to sort of deconstruct the romance and reveal some of the, the reality and the politics and the intrigue behind it. Ah, beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> okay, so at that point, I think this is a great point for us to take a, take a very quick break. <laughs> and already come back. 50 minutes into your time. <laughs> it was beautiful 50 minutes. And when we come back, uh, you know, I want to speak to you about, about brand Ketla. Uh, Stay with us. We'll be right back on the Filter Coffee Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Paytm Money. So, a great week of shows behind us and hope that you've been catching up on as much of it as you can. We had Abhishek Bachchan on Football Shootball. Yeah, let me say that again. Abhishek Bachchan was on Football Shootball. Did I mention Abhishek Bachchan was on Football Shootball? That was a fun episode. You should definitely check that out. Really, really deep conversation about cricket and things like that. We had Vikram Kochar on Cyrus Says, talking about the platforms and stuff like what's going on over there. On uh, the note, Maruk had spoken to Sanjay Jha, which was, again, a really, really interesting conversation. On Edges and Sledges, the guys are having an interesting conversation about, well, you know, what are favorite formats of cricket and things like that. So it's just really been a really, really awesome week on the network. And please do check things out. And with that, let's get you back to your show. Welcome back to the Filter Coffee Podcast. We're speaking with Manu Pillai, author of uh, The Ivory Throne. Manu, uh, we spoke a lot about the book and, uh, you know, the House of Travancore and the extraordinary history of uh, the senior Rani and her feud with uh, the junior Rani and, and what ensued. I want to sort of uh, take a quick uh, detour and talk about uh, Kerala itself, right? I think uh, while the book is one of the most gripping pieces of history that, that one can read, I think the, the preface to the book itself is is something that a lot of people have, have spoken about, right? It's, it's all mm-hmm. of 18 pages, but in it, it sort of uh, beautifully gives you a sense of Kerala, you know, uh, a century back right? or multiple centuries back. Mm-hmm. I want to sort of look at that and also look at what we know of brand Kerala today, right? And if I look at brand Kerala today, it seems like a place which certainly does not belong with the rest of India. Sometimes it seems to me that it doesn't even belong with the rest of South India. Um, Mm -hmm. Tamil Nadu, which has had, which probably is associated mentally with Kerala so much, also has such a very different story, very different culture, etc. And if we look at what is is it that sets brand Kerala differently, you know, there is a lot of talk about uh, education in Kerala. Uh, There's a lot of talk about uh, religious harmony in Kerala. A lot of talk about about women empowerment in Kerala, right? Like, for example, if you were to take religion per se, Kerala is very different compared to the rest of the country, right? Mm-hmm. It's a place where, um, and like you, you know, as you beautifully describe in, in your preface, it's a place where Christianity existed even before it came into Europe, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, mostly thanks to Saint Thomas, and it's a place where Islam came through trade. But it was it was embraced beautifully, right? Uh, yeah. To give examples from your own book, there are Krishna temples, processions where you know Saint Thomas image is taken along, you know, back in the day, and uh, the Zamorin at one point is presiding over a community that is so well knit between Hindus and uh, and Muslims that he says uh, uh, that every fisherman have family should have at least one child which become which is which is brought up as a Muslim right yeah so all of these things happen how much of these have we lost over time and I'll come to to women's empowerment separately and and uh, the other point in, in religion again is uh, is the fact that, uh, that the Christians of, of that time don't necessarily uh, they, they all come from the their, their allegiance is to the church in Turkey right and hence the, the Syrian Christians right 
Uh, how much of that religious harmony have we lost today? Is it intact? Uh, what are your views on that? So, you know, the fact is that both Islam and Christianity are very old in Kerala. Mm -hmm. Now, there are, of course, legends associated with both. It's a St. Thomas story, for example. There is no hard proof saying that St. Thomas actually came. But it is clear that Christianity has been in Kerala for a very long time. Because there is uh, only a few centuries later, there's evidence of a thriving community already. So it's not as though, uh, you know, a few centuries later, they appear for the first time. They appear in positions of some influence. It's the same with this official legend or the official narrative goes that in the lifetime of the Prophet himself, the first mosque was constructed in Kerala. So the Prophet dies in 632 CE, I think, and this was built around 629 CE. Obviously, the current structure is not that old, so there's no way to scientifically date it. But, you know, you, you, you find other clues in history, which is that if that happened, whether it happened in 629 or not, by 849, just two centuries later, you find Arabic signatories on the, on a grant given by a Hindu king to Christians. So Hindu king is giving a grant to a Christian community and the witnesses are Muslims, you know, with, with proper Islamic and Arabic names, which means that if they are already witnessing royal grants by the ninth century, it means they've already been there for some time. They are an influential community. It's not like random traders just came in and decided to sign uh, a royal grant. Royal grants are signed by people who have some influence in society. So both of these give you the impression that definitely, uh, say about 1,000, by about 1,000 uh, years ago, 1,200 years ago, Islam was definitely in Kerala. And you can say about the same about 1,500 years for Christianity. Mm -hmm. Now, the two communities in many ways became something like another Hindu caste. And, you know, in, in, in this context, Hindu becomes an anachronism because the idea is that these were all different castes and the, the Muslims and the Christians occupied what would have been, say, the, Vaish the Vaishya groups or the trading communities. And the interlocking was so uh, natural in many ways that you find rituals that where these two communities are involved. So if you look at the nerchas of the, the Mapala, the Muslim community in Malabar, and you compare images of these nercha festivals with the images of the Trishur Puram at the great temple in Trishur of the Hindus, you'll find it's practically the same. Trishur is bigger because it's a much bigger festival. But the same drummers who come from the same community, the same elephants, the elephants are decorated in the same way, similar processions, everything is almost exactly the same. The only difference is in one, a few people may wear skull caps. In the other, there's no such thing. But otherwise, the cultural ingredients are the same. A cousin of mine recently married uh, a Syrian Christian girl. And, you know, when they were figuring out how to do a lot of the wedding rituals, well, she said, no, but we share a lot of rituals anyway, because they also have uh, similar, you know, the, the way the malas are exchanged when she arrives. There's a ritual where the girl has to hold an olakora or one of these old old fashioned umbrellas, which, you know, in Kerala, Brahmin women were, were known to use. Uh, they have all kinds of rituals that seem highly Hinduized in nature, but I shouldn't use the word Hinduized. It's just how Malayalis were. It didn't matter what your religion was. Everybody had a same sort of external culture in the way they lived. Uh, in my own family and in temples around Kerala, in many Orthodox holy Brahmin families as well, what you find is that ghee and oil that was brought for use in the houses, in the temples, they could only be allowed inside the kitchen once a Syrian Christian had touched it to purify it. So to make the ghee shuddha to be taken inside the house, you needed a Christian to touch it. Not anybody else, not some random Christian. It had to be a Syrian Christian of the right kind of family to come and touch it. So in my own family, the story goes, you know, they'd find some child or somebody to come and just namesake, give it a, a quick touch with his finger. And that was all. That was all that was needed. But lots of overlaps like this. The other clue is also legendary uh, suggestions, right? So the, the oldest political legend in Kerala is the story of this king called Cheraman Perumal. So all the rulers of Kerala, the Zamarans of Calicut, the Maharajas of Cochin, the Maharajas of Travanko, they all claim some kind of connection to Cheraman Perumal. So Cochin says they are his matrilineal descendants. The Zamarans say they are descended from his generals. Uh, Travanko says they are descendants from his son. Everybody's got a connection politically to Cheraman Perumal. He is the legitimizing authority for all these uh, genealogies, all these families. So in his legend, this king is the ruler of all Kerala. He hears, I mean, there are multiple retellings of the story. In one story, he actually witnesses the prophet splitting the moon and he decides he wants to go to Arabia and meet the prophet. In another, there's a trader who comes and tells him about the prophet and he says, this is amazing, I want to go meet Muhammad. Either way, in all legends, you find that he actually does uh, give up his religion, converts to Islam and sails to Mecca. So in the founding political legend of Kerala, 
I'm not talking about the Parashurama legend because that's a much right, older right. sort of mythical thing. This is something that is slightly more historical because actual historical dynasties kept this Cheraman Perumal memory alive. In the founding political legend, there's already Islam. There's already mention of the Prophet. You know, it's not like Islam is is is, is uh, absent in any of these old legends. So too, there's this other legend called Parai Pette Pandurukulam, which is about mm. a sage and a paraya woman and how they produce uh, different children, uh, 12 children, one of whom is a deity, one of whom is a Brahmin, one of whom is the carpenter, one of whom is a girl through whom a major Naya family is descended. But one of their children is also a Muslim. So, you know, it's it, even in that legend, there is a Muslim present. It, all of these are equal constituents in society. You know, there's, uh, as you mentioned, there are temples where St. Thomas's image was carried along mm-hmm. with the Hindu deities. Much of this is stopped now because people have become more puritanical in a very Victorian sense. So they've given up any element which to them seems like it may come from another religion or another culture. But despite that, on the ground, there is a lot of uh, overlap between these religions. And I have a feeling that, you know, this does play a role in Kerala's political culture as well, which is firstly that the minorities in Kerala are not small groups. Groups. They're as much as 45% of the population. It's not like they, they, they became some large group in, in recent years. They've been there for hundreds of years, over a thousand years. So culturally, Hindu society is used to their presence. There's nothing that's mm. uh, shocking or jarring or somehow that threatens Hindu security. They've been there. They've been a part of their villages and vicinity and all of that for all these years. So, you know, there's that. And of course, the fact that these, because these communities were historically involved in trade, they also tend to be fairly prosperous communities. Some of the biggest businessmen in Kerala come from the Christian and, and the Muslim communities. So it's not like they're a weak minority. So that means that there is a sense of self-assurance and confidence in them. And the Hindus have also treated them like that. And another reason why a religious polarization has not worked very far in Kerala, at least as of today, as of now, is that the Hindus are still, uh, I mean, although Kerala is not casteist in a very obvious way, like uh, if a Dalit cooks, people are going to, aren't going to come and say, oh my God, I'm not going to touch this food. People mm-hmm. aren't going to discriminate in, class, in classrooms. People don't have issues where you can't drink from one well because that's an upper caste well. None of those issues exist. But there is still a sort of subtle casteism under the facade of, you know, this this very liberal, uh, well-exposed society. And that is chiefly between the Naya community, which is the old landed community, and the Iriva community, which was originally much lower in caste, but through the 19th century, it rose in prominence and became a major force. So Hindu consolidation has also not happened because these two communities are extremely, they're still at sort of, you know, loggerheads. They're still rivals of each other. So they don't see themselves as members of one block. There is a Naya block, there is an Irava block, there is a Christian block, and there is a Muslim block. And of course, within them, there are sub blocks as well. But that's how community, that's how politics is done even now. So religious polarization still isn't there. It wasn't there in the past. You yeah. find, you know, even in the in the 16th century, when there is this text that's written by a, 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 a Mapla in Malabar, he, he calls for jihad, but he calls for jihad against the Portuguese. You know, he says the Hindu kings of Kerala treated us very well. We have no quarrel with them. It is with the Portuguese who've come here and sort of infected this place with new dynamics and new uh, religious animosities, etc. The Portuguese were extremely sort of violent. And, and they did persecute the Muslim community because the Muslims were in trade and the Portuguese wanted to take over that trade. So, you know, there is some element there, but that again is not turned towards the local people. That's turned towards the foreign, uh, you know, presence in Kerala. Right. And, and, and of course, the, the entire um, um, bloody nature of uh, how Portuguese tried to get a hold, um, foothold within Kerala, is, uh, that's a separate story altogether. Mm-hmm. But what I find fascinating is, I think, you know, the cinema of oh. a uh, tells a lot about uh, the cultural history and heritage of the place, and uh, and I think you don't have to go beyond, you know, what you see in Malayalam cinema today to understand how religion and even for that matter caste is, is perceived. Right? Uh, I was recently seeing a film which is about uh, an, an evangelical. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I saw that. Right, and and and, and uh, you know, it, it basically a racket, you know, which is on on on, on evangelical Christians. Yeah. And sort of how this works, etc. And I think I found it very interesting that uh, the, the person who made that film was a Muslim. Right? And it, yeah. it's, uh, it, it's a big deal because you're not from Kerala. People who are in Kerala look at it as a piece of art and then just move on with it. Right? 
Yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's not really yeah. caused. I mean, I didn't like the movie because midway through the movie, I thought it, yeah. it sort of lost the plot a little bit. Absolutely, but it opened yeah. really yeah. well. I loved the way it was sort of lampooning this entire sort of evangelical process, and you know the sort of some of the shams that work around it. Exactly. I was, it, yeah. and, but you can do that in Kerala. In Kerala, it's still possible to do that. And of course, there are threats to it, like any any other place in India where cultural freedoms and and the liberty to sort of use your creativity without self censorship. That is under it, it's it's growing, but the threat in Kerala is also growing. But it's not reached some kind of you know uh, dangerous situation. You don't have a Perumal Murugan side kind of uh, right. person being sieged yeah. and attacked and that sort of thing. In fact, there was one uh, writer called uh, you know Harish who was who was you know he writ- he's written this book that's been translated now in Malayalam. It's called Misha, but in English it's called Mustache. And what's interesting is. It's actually a passing line. There's this dialogue between two people, and one of these random people says, "Oh, you know, why do you think all these women are going to the temple decked up? Because they're showing that they're available to find mates." And it's just a dialogue by one floozy character, and it's not even an integral part of the story. But you know, there was this group of people who latched onto that and saying and said, "This insults Hindu women and this and that." And I was like, "This is so comical." It did create a minor sort of you know fear in in the author's uh, mind. Of course, it did create a lot of. Controversy, but you know, Kerala media responded, public civil society responded, and the book not only you know went out and sold well, but it was even translated into English partly, you know, because people were determined to see it, uh, to do to see it do well. So there is, there are still mechanisms in Kerala where there is a resistance to this. It's not as though right. it'll be easy to come and uh, take over the place. There is still enough of a of a fight left in in local society when it comes to these things. Right. People are aware that you know there are certain things they will fight. On and they'll have their own politics, and Congress and the commies will fight and have their own uh, internal and external feuds and all of that. But uh, there are certain rules of the game, I think, which still stand, and nobody wants to uh, allow those to be upset by an external factor and by a, uh, a new ideology. Yeah, and in fact, talking about uh, women taking up to find mates, mm-hmm. and why this statement of uh, cultural whatever is is funny is is the history of women in Kerala itself, right? Um, uh, at this point, I'm, I'm 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 quoting from your book, which is actually a quote from from Barbosa, where you know he's talking about the women and the princesses he meets in this region, and it says, "quote These princesses do not marry, nor have any fixed husbands, uh, and are very free and at liberty in doing what they please with themselves." Uh, stop quote. And uh, Kerala, you know, back in the time. Um, you know, in the 1500s and 1600s itself, to this day, um, it's been a very different universe for women right, compared to the rest of the Indian subcontinent, right? Yeah. I think uh, uh, there's one part of the book where you talk about uh, a small Raja who um, whose defense includes uh, 300 archers who were entirely women. Yeah. And uh, there's other part where uh, women from royalty sort of walk into a court with nothing more than a, a loin cloth. Yeah. And uh, that's Lots how... Lots of the, jewels, but... but jewels. Yes, yeah. yes. And uh, and that's how uh, it has always been, right? I think uh, uh, this whole covering your, your chest and your bosom and even uh, your bosom as a as a sexual device was a, was a much, much later sort of thing. Right? In fact, it yeah. was considered uh, um, not decent to wear a blouse for, yeah. the, for the longest time. Even... Um, in the in the early 1900s in, yeah. in Kerala, right? Yeah, and women have enjoyed uh, that sort of, and of course there is the matrilineal system itself. They enjoyed that sort of a freedom, um, and the book itself, because I've written is entirely about two two queens. How how unique is this, Manu, uh, in an Indian subcontinent perspective? And uh, again, this is another thing that that defines brand Kerala, isn't it? Yeah, you know, I would only qualify it one way, which is that we should never forget caste and all this, which is that mm-hmm. a lot of these freedoms we're talking about is upper caste women. You know, lower right. caste women depends, of course, within the Irava community, for example, technically lower caste, but one of the richest families in Kerala was an Irava family. They were one of the first people to own a motor car in Kerala. And the irony was, of course, the members of the family in those days, because of caste, were not allowed on certain roads. So every time the car hit those particular roads, the owner had to get out and take a back route through some, you know, some dirt, some dirt track through the forest. And his driver, who was upper caste, could continue driving the car. 
but but in general, a lot of these privileges we're talking about is upper caste Naya women, the, the you know the aristocracy, royalty, etc. And Brahmin women, of course, had a nightmare of an existence. They were stuck mm-hmm. in Parda for all practical purposes. Many of them died as spinsters. They couldn't find husbands. If they did, it was usually their fathers trading them off uh, with some, a very old person, you know, and, and in turn marrying that old person's daughters himself. So very complicated situation for Brahmin. So the polyandrous piece was not applicable to. No, it was there. So you find that it, across castes, you do find a polyandrous element. For example, there are several artisan castes where you find that, you know, often brothers will have one wife in common. And that was considered perfectly fine. It did not matter. And it was called Pandavachar, you know, like the Pandavas. It was, that's how some of the, some of the upper castes referred to it. But even among the elites, you find this was perfectly normal. So, you know, within the, in the court, princesses used to take Brahmin husbands and the children of course belonged to the mother's caste under matrilineal law so the the children were Kshatriyas and they were members of the royal family but the men the fathers used to come from these Brahmin families and the fathers were paid a salary of 8 rupees and 6 rupees depended on which kind of you know how aristocratic the Brahmin's family was if he was from a highly placed family he was given 8 rupees a month if it was a normal family he was given 6 rupees a month but they were kept there as essentially paid uh, you know consorts they were not they were not husbands in the conventional sense of the word as we see it today where they are the heads of the family or they have some special rights on the contrary you know they can be discarded at any moment by their royal wives and you know it, it happened to my own great great grandmother for example she was married to a brahmin as well technically he's superior in caste you know she is from the next rung the matrilineal caste hmm. and what's interesting is that you know they had she got pregnant she had a, a baby but the baby was a girl and it was still born now, if it was a boy, it would not have mattered. But because it was a girl and girls matter in the matrilineal system, when her Brahmin husband came, her mother stopped her at the door and said, enough, this marriage is over, you can go back to your place. She's not going to see you again or come back to your place. They were both extremely fond of each other, but that was that, you know, it, it didn't matter that he was higher in caste and he was this extremely opulent Brahmin or any of that. Once the woman's family decided that there was no need for him there, he had no say over there. And you find, you know, uh, a similar thing in Cochin. In fact, the, hus- the, the very word for husband... Just, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but sorry. does he ever come back? Uh, he sadly, no, the story goes that he sat there for an hour and wept, asking for his wife to be returned to him. She also did like him very much, but they were not allowed to be reunited. Unfortunately, she then married my actual great-great-grandfather, which was not a happy marriage at all. But then... And around 33 years later, when that old Brahmin was on his deathbed, he sent a messenger asking to see her one last time. Except that by then she was not, she was not in a position to go, but her children went and saw. So the Brahmin's mm-hmm. first wife's children by her second husband went and saw him when he was on his deathbed. And so it's a, it's a complicated story, but it was possible. These things were possible in Kerala at the time. And in the Kochit royal family, even the word that was used for these husbands is very revealing. So the word is not Bhartava, which is your normal Malayalam word for husband. It is Irupu Garden. Irupu means to sit. And Irupu Garden basically means the person sitting in your palace. Because it's the woman's palace, he's the one who's come and sat there. And he's the one who's sitting in that uh, sort of anti chamber waiting to be summoned by his wife that is the sort of general connotation here and this you know what is even more stark is in naya families now naya families officially don't have the punul so they're not considered chatriya like the marathas like the nayakas they're all considered officially by the brahmins they're considered part of shudra varma but they are the landlords they are also extremely wealthy they are the landed dominant caste so the one of the most elite naya families in kerala was the palium family in cochin they were considered even richer than the cochin royal family thousands of acres 11000 tenants tilling their lands uh, you know 40 over 40 temples controlled by the family, you know, extremely powerful family. And here, when the husbands came, they were also, again, Brahmin husbands that these Naya women usually took. And the Brahmins always felt a little awkward about eating the food from, uh, you know, uh, the house of Ashudra. You know, at the end of the day, even if your wife was the superior one economically, even if she came from an aristocratic family, the Brahmin was still a Brahmin. So he would feel a little awkward about eating from the kitchen of his Shudra wife. So obviously, a separate building was allocated for these, these, these Brahmin men. And just to sort of soothe their egos, it was called the Ishwara Seva building. Ishwara Seva means basically, you know, serving God. Service of God. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's, it's almost considered as, oh, that's just a general place where you serve God. And the Brahmins happen to go and eat there just to sort of paper over the awkwardness that they were actually eating the salt of a Shudra family. So, you know, there were all these devices and, and means to bypass even the caste system. And Maitreleni did give women a certain degree of autonomy. Mm-hmm. 
uh, as far as their personal relationships went. It should not be overstated again, because you do find that, you know, often nobody, people but did not use the polyandrous option. Sometimes, you know, you find these great love stories where, you know, people do stay together for decades. My great grandparents, you know, unhappy marriage after she discarded the Brahmin, unhappy marriage, but they lasted for decades. They, they never, she never divorced him. She had the option, but she never divorced him. So, you know, there were unhappy marriages, there were happy marriages. But it was a system in which if the woman chose, she did have the option of getting out of a bad marriage. Uh, property, she had the option of controlling and, and, and mm. determining where the economic resources went. The British came and of course, they started recognizing only the eldest male member as representative of the family. But in general, the women also had considerable say in these matters. Women were not, in, in, in many cases, women were not some kind of domat. Uh, so they were not in a domat situation as far as their husbands right. or brothers right. were concerned. They did have a say. They did have a degree of autonomy. But I would qualify and say that it wasn't equality. It was just that it was less unfair. Men still in many ways had the upper hand. It's just that the women were not completely marginalized either. They had. They were in a position if they so chose to assert themselves. Right. Now, I understand that it shouldn't be overstated. But, but even without overstating it, uh, you know, in a land where uh, I think there was a point where the the... the Muslim women of the point uh, that we're talking about didn't necessarily have to wear parda, right? And when I, when I look at, uh, even without overstating the state of women there to, to the rest of the subcontinent at comparable times, it seems like a, you know, like a, like a Wakanda to the rest of India's Gotham, right? <laughs> uh, it's, it, it is fascinating. And what is equally fascinating is, and of course, a lot of this changed with the British, but uh, taking that away, if you look at the modern political class uh, in Kerala, you know, if, if you look at the rest of the country, right, uh, or the rest of the world, rather, the political class has had a, a big hand in changing the culture of the place itself. Uh, but in Kerala, and, and correct me, you know, if I'm wrong, and I'd love to know what you feel about it. Uh, they seem to have, in large parts, preserved the core of the culture, right, uh, that this land collectively had at one point. Even though, if you know, the the power change at hands across parties, uh, there seems to be like a, you know, common minimum consensus on what the idea of Kerala is across uh, political aisles. So would you say that is correct? I think it is. It's also partly for the simple reason that the public in Kerala is very politically aware. And I remember, you know, being rather struck that by the late 19th century, there was a huge newspaper boom in Kerala. By the early 20th century, you find, you start seeing records where in a village, you find these, you know, there are these kattas and these these junctions where people will come and hang out, the men at least. And you find that, you know, uh, at least one person will actually read out the paper and this entire village community, the news sort of disseminates. So people were aware of a sort of larger world. There was a sort of political awareness that was building up in people. The other thing is, you know, the contribution of communism. Now, what's interesting is Kerala, on the one hand, had an extremely feudal culture. You know, a handful of families in Malabar controlled thousands of acres. So if you're talking about the Zamarin's family, over 100,000 acres of land. Kavla Param Upil Nair has 15,000 acres of land. The Paliam family I mentioned, again, a prominent Nair family, some 12,000 acres of land. You know, massive uh, feudal culture. But then Kerala also generated the extreme opposite, which is communism. You know, even when the Maharani of Travanko finally left her palace and moved to Bangalore, one of the tri- immediate triggers was that the communists had been elected. Her own palace servants who yesterday, till yesterday, were bowing to her and extremely obsequious, they suddenly formed a union and they decided that you know they, they were going to demand higher salaries and so on. And one fine morning, she woke up and she realized there was a communist flag that had been sort of put on top of her on the palace roof. And that's when she realized, you know, the world has changed. I'm, I'm just going to go focus on my family and live with my daughter. So there was communism brought another extreme sort of thing to it. But together, there was an interesting sort of play that took place. So on the one hand, growth of literacy and political awareness resulted in a certain number of policies, a certain kind of attitude. So a certain investment in education, a certain investment in sort of, you know, pursuing a certain kind of lifestyle and so on. Communism came and brought in a welfareist attribute to it. You know, so they developed the infrastructure even further, whether it's schools, whether it's medical facilities, all of that. And the, they changed the discourse very much. So egalitarianism became a part of the discourse of practically every Everybody. You couldn't really escape it. It became a very prominent part of Kerala's discourse, which is why even today Kerala in some ways exists in its own little ecosystem. Sometimes you find, you know, I think even when Indira Gandhi was kicked out after the emergency, 
not only did she do generally quite well in the south, but Kerala was one of those places that returned her with the fewer seats that she got in parliament. Uh, similarly, you know, where Congress loses heavily in the north, it will still win in Kerala. <laughs> you know, it's a very mm-hmm. strange pattern. Kerala does not seem to move by the national groove. Yeah. And if you look even at the corruption scandals, I think the last uh, Congress chief minister was embroiled in one, which I think was an 18 crore scandal. Now, 18 crore is small change if you compare it with a state like Maharashtra. In mean, Maharashtra, in, in, in Delhi, the scandals, when you talk about a financial scandal, you're talking about hundreds and thousands of crores. You know, the whole 2G spectrum was, you know, what, 70,000 crores. That's the kind of figures that you associate with a scam in, in, in most parts of India. But in Kerala, 18 crores, which is frankly, you know, uh, as I said, looking at the kind of uh, revenue figures and, and the kind of amounts. It's a rounding that, error. Right? Yeah, <laughs> like in, the, in everywhere else, including Tamil Nadu, which is a major manufacturing state. 18 crores is nothing. But hmm. in Kerala, it was enough for that man's career to be seriously affected. Even right now, you know, the, the chief minister has done an amazing job with the COVID crisis, but that didn't stop the opposition from immediately latching onto the this current crisis that's going on about uh, a gold smuggling racket in which yeah. the chief minister's yeah. private, uh, sorry, chief uh, principal secretary's name has been dragged in. And whether it's true or false is not the point, but democracy is working. And it, it may not be pleasant. It may be, uh, for all you know, it's, it, it's, it's in sight of the elections coming up, you know, in, in very shortly in Kerala. But the point is that that's what opposition is supposed to do. That is what they are, it's their job to do that. They're not supposed to sit on their bums and pretend that, you know, everything is normal. They are supposed to hold the executive to power. So when the 18 crore solar scam happened, when the Congress was in power, the CPM did it. And now you have a similar thing where the Congress is holding the CPM to account. It is important that this happened because it keeps that democratic culture alive. It shows that even the chief minister is not some superhuman, uh, you know, figure you're supposed to worship. It keeps everybody's feet firmly on the ground. And I think that is a very useful element in Kerala culture. The fact that, you know, there is that kind of groundedness uh, in the state. Of course, there are people trying to change it, uh, but so far it Mm -hmm. hasn't worked. And hero worship I've not really seen in Kerala. It's simply not something uh, people do. And this may also explain why film stars in general haven't quite transitioned to politics in Kerala as they have in Tamil Nadu, for example. Yeah. In Tamil Nadu, in fact, Malayali film stars have gone in transition into politics. So, <laughs> they, <laughs> I suppose if a Malayali wants to get into politics, he needs to cross the border into Tamil Nadu. No, it's amazing, you know, some other time we should we should talk about how just a walk-off about a few hundred kilometers can can use Make some so contrasting much of pictures, right, uh, yeah. of these two states. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm conscious I've taken a lot of your time. I, I really wanted to, um, at this point, also confess that... Um, uh, besides my uh, uh, reading of the book, uh, there are a lot of others people that I spoke to, uh, mm-hmm. you know, people who are ardent fans of your your work. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, uh, many of them were very dear friends and they were very excited that uh, uh, I was speaking to you. And, and I, I wanted to kind of understand, um, you know, some of their, their perceptions of, you know, your book and your work, etc. And a common thread and it occurred to me as well, seems to be the, the depth of the research, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and one, of course, is uh, your ability to, uh, to put it across in a, uh, in, a, in a fashion that makes for easy reading, right? Uh, as mm-hmm. against some of the academic uh, history that is available. And the other part of it is, the, is still, you know, the depth of the research. And especially in the ivory throne, there's a lot of, lot of anecdotes. And one of the things I wanted to ask you is, how much access did you have to to the royal family itself as you were writing the book? So, you know, uh, research, of course, takes multiple levels. Increasingly in today's world, you can't just rely on records. You know, that mm-hmm. old uh, theory that records are where true history lies is not true because in especially in a caste society like ours, records privilege only the elites who could read and write. So you're excluding a huge chunk of society which has preserved its history in folklore and song, etc. So even with Martanda Vatma, you have the official written narratives about Martanda Vatma, but there are also these folk songs in which a counter-narrative exists on the ground where he's treated as a villain. And I found that extremely fascinating that, you know, you have uh, a, a non-codified, non-written down source where there is, and, and this is a very old source that's been passed down generation to generation among a certain set of people where he's a villain. So you have to play that against each other. Increasingly, you have to look at art, you have to look at architecture. So your sources are extremely varied now. Mm. Depending on the period, you also have to look at photography now, you know, because even that sometimes gives you gives you interesting clues and insights into things. But 
of course, if you're in, in the case of the Ivory Throne, because my characters had both the both the senior and the junior Maharani had died in only in the 1980s, there were mm. still people around who knew them. So there was, you know, opportunity to meet people who had who were in some way or the other associated with them. So as I said, M.S. Velithan, who founded the Sri Chitra Institute in in Trivandrum, he personally knew the Maharani. So it was useful to meet him. I went and met a 90 something year old anthropologist in London called Adrian Mayer. He was the last person to interview the Maharani a month before she passed away in 1985. And he still had the interview notes and and, and the transcript and things like that. So I found that very useful. Uh, and, And of course, I had easy access to the senior Maharani's branch of the family, which is because, you know, even though there are a few negative things about one of the senior Rani's husband, for example, they didn't really mind it because, as I said, they've left that whole royal hangover. Like they don't really think of themselves as royalty. They live, you know, fairly cosmopolitan lives. They've been exposed to the world. So they're willing to accept that, yeah, sure, you know, granddad may have had some negative sides and attributes to him as well. The junior Mm -hmm. Rani's side, however, only her nephew spoke to me. Her direct descendants uh, closed the doors and said they were unwilling to to participate in the project, partly because I transparently told them that the records, at least as, as I found them not only in Delhi, but also in the British archives, also in private diaries, practically anywhere I looked, the records were not flattering as far as their ancestor was concerned. So then they were a little uncomfortable and understandably so. For me, Junior Rani is a historical figure. For them, it's grandmother. So, you know, I understand that they were unwilling to participate. But yeah, so to that extent, when interviews and, and, you know, obtaining insights from people who knew these figures is concerned, only one side cooperated uh, quite generously. The other side chose not hmm. to uh, not to participate and that is their right it's fine interesting you know and i'll, I'll be remiss uh, if i did not uh, mention the other aspect that many of them mention especially a very dear friend of mine kiran mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know i had a long conversation about the book uh, i wanted to understand uh, you know other readers perspectives and and interestingly you know she compared uh, the sort of reading experience to uh, to stefan zweig's books right mm-hmm in terms of how it uh, captures an era so beautifully. Um, and then one of the things that, um, one of the feedback that many of them had was also that, I think, is it correct? Did Ivory Throne take about uh, six, seven years of work? Six years. Yeah, I, six started years. In, I started the actual process in 2009. The story came to me in 2008 itself. But, you know, 2009 was when I first started toying with the idea of doing a book around it and, you know, first gained access to the private papers of Maharani. Right. And then, yeah, the book was published in December 2015. So, yeah, it took about six years. That's interesting. You know, one of the other the, the observation they made was while, while the ivory throne um, sort of felt it's like every episode was like a war and peace, Mm-hmm. Uh, sort of a work um, in your subsequent books you sort of uh, make or most of them a short story sort of an anecdote and then sort of what right yeah i mean it was uh, have you heard that before the- uh, yeah, in fact, it was deliberate because you see, the yeah. Ivory Throne got me used to writing extremely long chapters. I had all the space I wanted. At that time, it was my first book. So I was not constrained by the idea of fitting it within a word limit. I had no idea about publishing none of that. So I wrote as I liked. So, yeah. you know, it was a 245,000 word manuscript. It's a 704 page book. So it's a giant sort of volume. But yeah. I never realized it. I was doing these, these chapters. And frankly, each chapter is about the length of a master's thesis in a UK university. That's how long each chapter proved to be. But uh, with the second book, firstly, the the period was much, you know, it, it's an earlier period. It's an early modern period where everything ends in the 17th century. So mm-hmm. it begins in the, third, in, the, in the late 13th century and ends by the late uh, 17th century, early 18th century at most. So the, firstly, your material is, is not as dense as it is with the Ivory Throne. This is you're talking about Rebel Sultans. Rebel Sultans. Yeah. Ivory Throne, I had materials. As I said characters had just died in the 80s. So I had, material to, I had access to written material, people who knew them, photographs, you know, their own p- private papers. Diaries of other people who knew them, uh, yeah. the records in, of the Indian government, records of the British, you know, material in all these journals, newspapers, all of that was available. If you go further back in time, a lot of that material becomes slender. You don't have that many resources to play with. So the second book, I deliberately wanted to do a more fast paced uh, book, trying to cover a much larger space with larger characters. On one hand, to sort of challenge my own capacity to do it, which is Mm. that I wanted to break out the habit of having written these 20,000 word chapters and do something that was much slimmer. 
And the third book is just a collection of essays written over, over three years. So they were always meant to be short snippets mm-hmm. of history. And, you know, some of it, uh, some of it is just things that interested me, things I had read, you know, certain questions that came to my mind. And it was just compiled together. But the fourth one I'm working on again is perhaps, you know, I mean, the fourth one, well, I should technically say fifth one, because the fourth one is already done. It'll come out uh, early next year. Mm-hmm. But there's a fifth one that's been in, in the works since 2012. So when I took a break from the ivory throne once for about six months, I did the first cycle of research for it. And then on and off, I've done cycles of research for this project, you know, over the last eight years. And by the time it comes out, it'll be 10 years. So it'll be just a, another wow. giant volume. It won't be as long as the ivory throne because I don't want any book to be that long. But yeah, it is going to be, that's probably going to be a much heavier book. It's probably going to be a much more serious book in terms of how it reads as well. So if ivory throne was, also peppered with a lot of drama and all of that. This right. is a much more sort of intellectualized affair. And all of this is partly also me trying to challenge myself. I, I don't want to keep repeating the same thing. But that said, it is, I, I, I do recognize the fact that given the reception Ivory Throne received, there is uh, some expectation in people that I will keep producing books like that. But the problem with having produced a 700 first rather than last in my life is that you can never replicate it. It's, you know, that's always going to be a book that can't be replicated. Anything else after that will be, uh, I suppose, a different affair. It won't be the same as the Ivory Throne. And then and, and everybody who, who reads this, also has this other thought, which I guess is universal, is uh, this will make for an extraordinary series. Uh, So there is one that may or may not happen in the sense that mm. the book has been optioned for a series Mm. by the makers of Bahubali. Of course, it won't be made like Bahubali, which was a feature film. It will be made more along the pattern of The Crown, which you must have seen on Netflix, something Mm. like that. But, you know, it's it's still at groundwork level. It's not, you know, they're still figuring out those things, screen, play, mood, board, all those things. I don't know when it'll happen. And I'll only believe it'll happen when the cameras start rolling. And I'm absolutely sure that they've, they've started it. They still have you know room to, to work that out. And right. hopefully it'll happen. Because I do think, you're right, it does have the ingredients for a rather interesting uh, you know, Netflix or a, or a web series of of, of some kind. Oh, that that that'll be one of a kind, uh, not just for the Indian audience, but for the for the global audience itself. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> hey, talking of which, we we usually end the episode by asking the guest what they are reading, listening to, or watching these days. I know with uh, your fifth book and with the PhD and with the pandemic in Pune, I don't know mm-hmm. how much time you have, but but what's taking up uh, that time? So I, you know, I'm watching this uh, German series called Dark, which is the science fiction series yeah. available on Netflix. So I'm sort of in the final season for that. But I've also just before you we we got on this call, I was I was trying to watch locate this Vikram Seth's book has been adapted. Uh, a suitable boy and I was trying to find it and just realized that it's not available in India yet so that yes. was a disappointment yeah. in terms of books I've got Benjamin's new book called Body and Blood which is a, a novel and I've just also started reading a book on Dada by Nauruji which is uh, written by a, which is published by Harvard University Press and written by a scholar based in America so that's my current non-fiction read and the other Benjamin's is my fiction read that, that's an extraordinary coincidence the <laughs> Benjamin's book by HarperCollins is also the last book that arrived at my door step yesterday already so okay. uh, <laughs> looking forward to that um, uh, do, do you listen to podcasts much I do I mean there was a time when I listened to it fairly regularly but now that I'm trying to sort of use use the lockdown and use the pandemic created work from home situation as much as possible to get a lot of work done right. I'm trying not to be distracted so I've fallen into this terrible habit of looking at my whatsapp once or twice a day rather than regularly so <laughs> Messages pile up, emails are piling up, but it's good. It's, it's, it's doing wonders for work. So I'm going to stick to that. Excellent. Uh, Manu, thank you so much. It's been an absolute exhilarating pleasure. Thank you for having me. I hope this wasn't an overlong episode for your, your show. Not at all. This is, this is like a trailer compared to uh, Amit Vardmas. So, yeah. <laughs> all <laughs> right. Beautiful. Thank you. Looking forward to both this series as well as uh, the next book. Thanks Excellent. again. Thanks for having me. So that was our show. If you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IBM network. You can listen to us on the IBM podcast app or ibmpodcasts.com. You can also follow us on our social media. We are at IBM podcasts on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want to reach out to me, I am the underscore Karthik. That's Karthik with an H on Twitter. 
and filter underscore coffee that's coffee with a K on Instagram Sachin Tendulkar Virat Kohli Don Bradman and now Cyrus Brocha okay probably not in the right company I mean Don Bradman is Australian but it's called Cyrus Says a wonderful show about everything find the show on the IVM podcast app ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to podcasts Hi, my name is Anupam Gupta. I'm B50 on Twitter. I am the host of Paisa Paisa, a show that talks money. On my show, I speak to experts from every field of money and finance, from stock markets, equities, debt funds, credit cards, life insurance, every possible area of money and finance that you can think of. We even did an episode on cryptocurrency. I've got fantastic guests from mutual funds to personal finance experts everywhere. Robo advisory startups, just name it, we've got it. At Paisa Paisa, we help you make smart decisions about money. You work hard for money. Now make your money work hard for you. New episodes out every Monday, and you can listen to my show on the IVM Podcast app or any other podcasting app that you have.